Today, the most important questions of life. Where did we come from? How did we get here? What brought us into existence? Charles Darwin, in his Origin of Species, admitted that he did not know how the first cell came into existence, but speculated that somehow a few simple chemicals combined and the first primitive cell emerged from the primordial waters of the early Earth. But today, Darwin's evolutionary assumptions are being challenged by molecular biologists, as scientists have discovered that the human cell is not simple, but complex beyond belief. One tiny cell is a veritable micro-miniaturized factory, containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery, made up of more than 100,000 million atoms. In the nucleus of each cell is the DNA molecule, which contains a storehouse of three billion characters of precise information in digital code. This code instructs the cell how to build complex shaped molecules called proteins all the work so that the cell can stay alive. Where did this precise information in DNA come from? Is it the product of purely undirected natural forces? Or is it the product of an intelligent designer? Bill Gates of Microsoft has said, human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any we've ever created. Today you'll learn why the digital code embedded in DNA in the human cell is compelling evidence of an intelligent designer. My guest is Dr. Stephen Meyer, co-founder of the intelligent design movement in the world, who graduated with his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge University. We invite you to join us. Welcome to our program. We've got a great one for you today. My guest is Dr. Stephen Meyer, philosopher of science, who got his PhD from Cambridge University in England and has written a best-selling book, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. Stephen, there's a worldwide debate going on about biology, and you've entered it. Tell me what the debate is. Well, it's an ancient debate. It goes all the way back to the, the ancient Greeks about w the origin of life. Is it the result of a purely undirected process? A material process or was a designing agent or intelligence involved in some way? And uh, that, that's a, an ancient debate and it's popped up all over again. Richard Dawkins has talked about this debate. Which side is he on? Well, he's on the, what we call the materialist side. He thinks the undirected processes have done it. He, he says that biology is actually the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, where the key word is for Dawkins' appearance. Things look designed, but they're not really designed. They don't owe their origin to an actual intelligent designer of any kind. And Francisco Ayala, he also has said that, and he's past president of what? Uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he says that it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living things can be explained as the result of a natural process, uh, natural selection, without any need for, to invoke a designer or a creator of any kind. Another place he says that Darwin gave us design, the appearance of design, without a designer. Now, give me the other side. Well, the, the alternative view is the theory of intelligent design, which says that, that living things give the appearance of design because they really are designed, and that you can tell when you examine the scientific evidence. The theory of intelligent design is a pretty simple idea at root. It's the idea that that we can detect the activity of intelligent agency in the effects uh, that they leave behind. If you go to Mount Rushmore, for example, you see the beautiful faces on the mountains there, and you realize that, uh, that a sculptor played a role. Now, inside cells, we don't have little uh, sculpted faces, but we have other indicators of intelligence, uh, digital code, complex uh, nanotechnology, little tiny miniature machines, things that we would in any other realm of experience attribute to intelligence. So, our argument is that what we see in biology doesn't give just the appearance of design, it's actually giving, giving us evidence of an actual designing intelligence. Now, you yourself, you struggled with these questions. You were a geophysicist at that time, and uh, then you met a fellow that we had on the program way back in 1985, his name was Dr. Charles Thaxton. Tell me about how he influenced you and how you went to Cambridge. 
Well, I, I got interested in the debate about the origin of life in a kind of odd way. There was a conference that came to the city where I was working that was examining that topic. And I was shocked when I attended the conference to find there were leading figures in, in the field who were all essentially acknowledging that we had no evolutionary account of the origin of the first life. I, I, had, thought, I had thought that the evolutionary bi biologists had this all sewn up, but it wasn't the case. And on that, one of the scientists on that panel was a man named, uh, named Charles Thaxon, who was living in Dallas, where I was living at the time. He'd just written a book called The Mystery of Life's Origin, in which he'd provided a really comprehensive critique of what was called chemical evolutionary theory, the attempt to explain the origin of the first life from simple non-living chemicals. And uh, he made the case, and this, the other scientists from various persuasions on the panel agreed that we didn't have an explanation for this, and it was a question that, that Darwin didn't address in, in 1859, and it really hadn't been solved in the, in the ensuing years. So I got fascinated with that, and a year later, when I went off to graduate school to England, uh, I began to, to study that, that question, the, the origin of the first life. All right. Now, we've got the uh, Darwin's Tree of Life up here, and explain, you just said that uh, Darwin didn't have an answer for this thing. Talk about this Tree of Life. Well, the Tree of Life was his famous depiction of the history of life. Uh, the the uh, vertical axis is, uh, shows the, the passage of time, and the horizontal axis is all the new form that arises over time. So if you look at the branches at the end of the tree, they represent all the forms of life that are on the planet today. And the idea in Darwin's theory is that new forms of life arise by a gradual evolutionary process that converts simpler pre-existing forms into those complex forms we see today. The, the simplest form where the whole process starts is represented by the trunk the, at the base of the tree. And Darwin didn't address the, the origin of the trunk, where we got the first life at the very beginning. And oddly, though there have been attempts to explain that since his time, 150 years on, we don't have any undirected evolutionary theory of the origin of, of life that, that is satisfying the scientific community. Yeah, down there at the bottom of the trunk, you, it's had, a mystery. you had a mystery, yeah. and they used to say there was a prebiotic soup, and now there is no prebiotic soup. You've discovered that, but the fact is the idea going at that time was there was some kind of soup, and the cell wasn't that tough a deal to uh, to unscramble. What did Huxley say about the well, cell way back yeah, then? Exactly. In the 19th century, uh, when Darwin first uh, proposed his theory, it was you know fairly quickly accepted by a lot of uh, of scientists. There was de debate, but but eventually a consensus arose that Darwin had refuted the design argument. He'd shown that there was no evidence of actual design in nature, only the appearance of design. And yet there was a question that he never resolved, which was how do you get life going in the first place? But scientists who were of a Darwinian perspective or persuasion didn't worry too much about that because they thought the cell was simple and it was inevitable that we would be able to explain it in the same kind of way involving purely undirected processes. And Huxley put it in a colorful way. He said that the cell is a homogeneous glob of undifferentiated protoplasm. It's like jello or something, some goo. But it didn't stay that way long. In other words, as, as science marched on, you got tools to better investigate the cell and Oprin came up with a theory for some of the new discoveries at that time. Explain his theory. Well, th maybe the first thing to say is that, that each time science discovered that there was more complexity involved in life than they thought, that the cell was a lot more complicated than they realized, then their ideas, scientists' evolutionary ideas about the origin of life had to keep pace with that. So scientists had to come up with a, an account of that. And the first one to do that was a man named Alexander Oparin, who developed what was called a chemical evolutionary theory, or sometimes called evolutionary abiogenesis, life from non-life. Mm -hmm. And he envisioned not a one or two step process, which is what Huxley and others were thinking about in Darwin's time. He envisioned a seven or eight step process where you started from very simple chemicals that combined and recombined as various energy sources were supplied, and then they eventually produced the proteins that we knew about. And, and then after that, there was a cell, an enclosure that was wrapped around those proteins, and voila, that would be the, f the, the first life. What Oparin didn't initially know about was this, the structure and complexity of DNA. It was really the discoveries that were being made in the 1950s by Watson and Crick and other scientists working on, on proteins. Watson and Crick studied DNA, other scientists studied proteins, and the more we learned, the more implausible this simple step-by-step -step evolutionary process began to seem. When they finally got down to DNA, what was the big mystery? What is that your book is all about? Well, there's two mysteries, and Watson and Crick solved the first one, which was the structure of the DNA molecule itself, and I would say associated with that is what it does. 
uh, on the screen you see the beautiful DNA double helix with the, the chemical subunits that make up the molecule highlighted on the right. And there you see uh, the, that there are, uh, there are some special chemicals that have little letters on them. And they're called, in chemical parlance, bases or nucleotide bases. And in 1953, Watson and Crick discovered the structure of the DNA molecule, but four years later, Crick had an incredible insight. I think it was a breakthrough insight in the whole history of biology. And it was formulated as a hypothesis that was subsequently confirmed by, by later discoveries, and it was called the sequence hypothesis. And his idea, which turned out to be correct, is that those four chemicals called bases function exactly like alphabetic letters in a written text or digital characters, zeros and ones in a machine code or a section of software. It's the specific arrangement of those bases that allow them to, to perform a communication function in the cell. They literally, the arrangement of those characters literally conveys information that allows the cell to build all the important proteins and protein machines that, it's, that it needs to stay alive. What you've presented to the people about DNA here, they can see those letters going up the spine there, and they want to know, okay, what is this code? What does it do? Why is it so important? Uh, the, the information encoded along the spine of the DNA molecule directs the construction of proteins and protein machines. And proteins are the, the, the toolbox of the cell. They do all the important jobs. Just as in the toolbox, you've got a hammer, a saw, a plane, and each one of those tools can perform a function partially in, in virtue of the specific shape it has. The same thing is true of proteins, that they perform different jobs in the cell based on their three-dimensional structure. Uh, but what the DNA does is it, it provides the instructions for the, a whole complicated assembly machinery for building those proteins. It's a little bit like what goes on at the Boeing plant up in Seattle where I live, where the engineers use a technology called CAD-CAM, Computer Assisted Design and Manufacturing, where they're actually, uh, will, they will choose design parameters. Those parameters will be, will be digitized, literally uh, codified in digital code that information will then be transmitted down a wire and it will tell some machinery where to, for example, put the rivets on, a, on a, an airplane wing or whatever the mechanical part is. In other words, in our manufacturing technology today, we use digital code to make mechanical parts. Turns out the exact same thing is happening inside the cell. The digital code is stored on the DNA and the mechanical parts are the proteins. And each one of them does a job in virtue of its three-dimensional shape, just like the tools in your, in your toolbox. You can't uh, hammer with a saw because it's got the wrong shape and composition. Uh, same thing is true in the cell. The shapes of the proteins determine the jobs that they do. And, um, and there are lots of intricate shapes. We've got some on the screen to, to my right. But How many different proteins are there? Well, there's, there's thousands of different proteins in, inside cells, and each one of them has a very specific task that it performs, which is what keeps the cell alive. Um, and, uh, but but the, the shape is critical. It allows the protein to do its job. On, on the, the next slide here, we have a protein that is involved in an enzymatic reaction. It's actually breaking apart a two-part sugar. At the top of the screen, you see a little, a little sugar that looks like a barbell. And you see how it nestles into a perfect shaped groove for those, the, the two parts of that barbell. And that, that hand and glove fit allows the enzyme to catalyze a breaking apart reaction that wouldn't happen without it. So it's again and again what you have is what's called specificity or specificity of fit. It's like hand and glove and it's that, that beautiful intricate three-dimensional shape of the protein that allows it to fit just right to do the job that it's, that it's designed to do. All right, folks, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to show you an animation of what DNA does and how complex this information is. This information will blow your mind when you see it. It is a fantastic animation that will, will give you an idea of what Steven's talking about here. We'll come back and we'll show it to you. We're back. We're talking with Stephen Meyer, who is a philosopher of science and is, uh, is, has written a mind-blowing book, The DNA in the Cell, The Signature of the Cell. And Stephen, take us back. Science, uh, recap a little bit of what we've been talking about. Science originally had this idea that the cell was simple, and now as the technology has developed, you have found it's very, very complex. Every one of us have, what, trillions of cells 
in our body. This is what we're talking about is what is in our body that you have discovered and why did, it, why did it blow your mind when you figured this out? Well, it's the fundamental question. How do you get life going in the first place? You can talk about how it changes and evolves after it started, but if you can't explain where it came from, you have a huge gap in understanding. And in the 19th century, in Darwin's time, when he developed his theory, it was thought that the cell was simple, a simple homo homogeneous globule of plasm was the, one of the, the, uh, the things that one of the scientists said. But we now know that the cell has an immense complexity. It's an integrated complexity, and it's an information-based uh, complexity. The, the in, inside the DNA molecule, we've discovered that there's a four-character digital code. Bill Gates says it's like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever created. And we now know that the information in the DNA is crucial for directing the construction of other complicated molecules called proteins, which do all the important functional jobs inside the cell. They're the toolbox of the cell. So you've got information directing the construction of, of machines and, 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 and complicated molecules that do all kinds of important jobs. So let's, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll give just a yep. little tiny science lesson uh, that explains how the information or in DNA constructs the proteins. Uh, I've got some snap lock beads here, and I've I stole these from my kids when they were really young, and they, they've been bitter and twisted ever since. But anyway, <laughs> um, the idea here is that each one of these, these snap lock beads represents an amino acid. Proteins are made of subunits called amino acids. There are 20 different varieties, and depending on the arrangement of those 20 different kinds of amino acids, the protein will form a different shape. It forms chain-like molecules, and depending on the arrangement, it will either make a shape like this, or maybe if you rearrange them, You'll get a different constellation of forces between these amino acids, and it'll make a different shape, okay? Now, proteins depend for their function on having the correct shape. So if you get the arrangement of the amino acids correct, then you're going to get the correct three-dimensional shape, and, and, and you'll have a, a protein will form that can accomplish a job inside the cell. So how does all that happen? Well, part of the answer is the instructions on the DNA molecule are directing the, the cell's information uh, pro production apparatus to produce those proteins, but there's more to the story because that production apparatus is itself incredibly uh, complex, it's a wonderful set, uh, kind of machinery. So we've got some animation to show the whole process, not like in civics where you know how a bill becomes a law, this is how a, how a DNA sequence becomes a protein. How many amino acids actually form a protein? What's the smallest protein and what's the largest? Well, the average protein is on the order of 300 amino acids in length. All linked together, All linked exactly together. right. Right. And you have very short uh, hormones that you can make with 8 or 10, but typically you need about 300. But some proteins are even, you know, have a thousands. Thousand. Yeah. So it depends, it really depends on the job the protein's doing as to how complicated the structure needs to be and therefore how many precisely sequenced amino acids need to be put in place. Yeah, and again, folks, this information has got to be arranged completely right or the protein will not form, the shape won't be there, and it won't do its job, it's a dead deal. Okay? And it's the information on DNA that gets it completely right, that directs right. that arrangement. Now we're going to show you a little bit of this complexity, and, and the big question that we're going to is where did this information come from? If you're starting from zero, could this information have come about by chance? Natural selection. All right, so let's watch this animation, and I want you to see this. Watch. 